Well, our uh, how we market our produce is we now grow produce 12 months a year. In the summer, we do about 18 acres of vegetables, high fenced and irrigated vegetables. And the high fences are for the deer. White-tailed deer are probably the big old, biggest, big old, biggest threat we have to what we're growing. Um, so, you know, we have those 18 acres of vegetables. Um, we also raise beef, pork, lamb, and rainbow trout. Um, and that we sell all on site here on the farm, um, frozen. Um, sometimes we do trout fresh. But uh, so our venue for, you know, getting rid of what we grow, um, to me, I kind of rank the priorities of what we grow. The number one priority to me is putting it on a plate and serving it. So Scott, um, our chef, he has kind of first dibs on everything the way I see it. And then uh, the second person on that list is our CSA customers. You know, they are the ones who are supporting us, um, you know, basically year round, putting their faith in us in the winter to buy a CSA share and then let us provide them with, you know, freshly picked produce in the summer instead of buying it off a truck from, trucked in from across the country and something that sat in the refrigerator for a week. So, you know, we're really fortunate to have people who bought into the idea of the CSA and, you know, I, to me, keeping them happy is extremely important. Third would come our farmer's market, um, you know, our farm market here on the farm. Um, and then when we have extra stuff beyond that, we take it to farmer's markets and we also do some wholesale directly to uh, some produce brokers um, or local restaurants or other retail establishments. But, um, you know, to me that, I mean, it's wonderful to have that, but it's also not uh, the top of the priority list to, you know, to knock your your price down to a wholesale price and um, the other thing that you know way that the uh, we sold a lot of food is through the produce broker and sometimes that'll end up in local school systems um, and to me that I guess ranks up there kind of with putting it on the plate to know that you're growing something and that children are eating you know something that you're growing instead of a, a sloppy joe out of a can on a, on a white bread or um, you know a lot. When I remember school lunches, I, I don't remember the food um, necessarily being good, no offense um, to anyone there, but you know, if you learn to eat hot dogs and french fries every day for lunch, um, you know, it's pretty easy to continue those eating habits into adulthood, and you know, whether or not that's a good or a bad thing, um, you know, I guess is a matter of opinion, but um, certainly the better you eat, um, in my opinion, the higher your quality of life. Um, because you feel better and you'll end up with less long-term health problems. And that's, you know, that's my humble opinion. But to me, when we do the farm education programs, I talk to children about, um, well, eating choices and that, but it's kind of like the fuel that you run through an engine. And if you run good, pure, clean fuel through the engine, you have less trouble than if you run fuel that, um, you know, is too rich or has water in it or whatever. And it's kind of, you know, the food that runs our body what we eat is the gasoline we put in our engine and uh, you know, if you don't put good gasoline in it you're going to end up with engine trouble before somebody who you know is running better fuel through their engine in general now you know that's something that uh, you know lady luck genetics and all that play a role in but certainly I think uh, you know if people can eat well they have a better chance of uh, staying out of the hospital than if they don't eat well you know Pond Hill is is unique in that the family that's running it has, you know, the Spencers have this vision, and I think they've had this vision for a long time, and they're just like the Welties, where they are always working and always doing something, and every time you go there, there's some crazy new project that is crazy good, not crazy bad, crazy new project that they've already finished, or and one lined up, and you think, how did they keep this going, and get this done, and start this new one? Um, and I think, you know, they're, they're agritourism piece with the dinners, and the animals, and the vegetables as well and, and their sales and the community garden plot piece that they have at their farm um, I think is, is really unique also and that I don't know that, that it's it's not something I think that will work everywhere I mean, you have to have the right infrastructure I think you clearly have to have the right personalities which they both Jimmy and Marcy and Jimmy's mom definitely have the right personalities for that uh, my family bought this half that we're on of the farm, which is 73 acres in 1980. And they bought uh, the 73 acres from a dairy farmer who owned this half and the other half of the farm. 
and he at that time um, was kind of on his way out of farming he still lived here but in my memories there was never cows living on the other side of the farm but anyway we grew up here on this side of the farm um, we didn't really do any farming um, my parents had always wanted to own a farm um, and we maybe grew a I don't even remember growing a vegetable garden but we had things growing in pots on the deck or um, so when I was a junior in high school the man who owned the farm next door passed away and the farm the other half of the farm became for sale and my parents bought the other half of the farm and that was in 93 I believe and then in 94 we started turning it back into a farm and uh, so my first summer job was working uh, with another neighbor up the road and we harvested a bunch of timber and milled it up and built the farm store um, and at that time we my parents hired a farm manager and he was here for maybe six months and then he quit and they hired another one and he was here for four months and he quit and during that time um, I used to work with my dad in his office he was an investment advisor and on Saturday mornings I would work for four hours in his office and it was the longest four hours of my life um, I just I wasn't meant to sit inside behind a computer or behind a desk and so when the le next farm manager quit, I asked him, um, you know, if I could have the job. And uh, so I came out here and plowed up a 10 acre hay field and tried to grow vegetables. And I had no irrigation and no deer fence and no knowledge. And I grew pig, pig weed that was six feet tall and harvested very little. Um, and certainly didn't harvest any of the pig weed because it all went to seed. And um, it was a pretty uh, eye-opening experience, I guess. And uh, so then I transferred, uh, I was going to school at Albion College in Southern Michigan uh, as an economics major. And so when I decided that what I wanted to do was um, you know, do the farm, I transferred to Michigan State. Um, and I was a horticulture major there. And that really, um, to be quite honest, I wasn't all that interested in economics. And I was there you know, to pass a, a test and not uh, necessarily really Anyway, when I transferred and was became a horticulture student, I was very interested in what I was doing, and I was already trying to do it, and so it was a lot more real to me. And uh, so I was at Michigan State for a year and a half, and coming home every weekend and working on the farm. And that, well, it only works for so long, and there was enough stuff going on here that I decided to, you know, take a semester off to. Actually, I did an internship here on the farm, um, establishing our first asparagus bed. But then after that, um, I just decided not to go back. It, you know, I had too, too much stuff going on here, and so I've been uh, doing it full-time ever since. They have done you know, a wonderful job and a, a really nice job of building their farm and building it piece by piece. You know, they didn't jump in and say, we're doing all these things all at once. You know, when they started farming and selling, they had a cooler down at the end of their driveway. You know, and that was not that long ago, I think 96 or 97 maybe. So in you know, less than 15 years, they've gone from a cooler at the end of the driveway to the operation that, that they have. So kind of where, where the farm started was, uh, you know, we started trying to produce food and food in the form of vegetables. Um, we didn't have uh, animals or, um, you know, any, any infrastructure. And so the early years were really... Um, building the infrastructure of the farm and, um, you know, getting deer fences and irrigation and, you know, really struggling to uh, to get, get people to come down the driveway because we were trying to sell retail, but, uh, you know, we were a small farm on a, you know, on a, out in the country and um, one, then we got animals and uh, I discovered pretty quick that the animals were, uh, you know, something that people wanted to see and something that, um, you know, added more than just animals to the farm. Certainly we needed them to, you know, for the waste to spread on the fields. Um, you know, we also needed them to eat, you know, the bunches of greens that go bad or, um, you know, instead of composting, everything gets fed to the critters. Um, but really, you know, we started out selling food and then, um, you know, I had extra tomatoes and extra different things and mom started canning them. Um, you know, and so that kind of started the, uh, the value added canned good line. Um, and now the canned goods is a big part of our business um, and also the the family fun aspect of it you know we have a lot of things for people to do to spend some time together you know it's one-on-one -on -one time and talking and so now um, feeding the animals is a big thing you pick berries uh, the squash rocket we do pig races 
Um, we do hay rides every Saturday and Sunday um, around the farm. We also do special events. We've got a trout pond on this side of the farm where people can feed the fish. We have a cafe that serves lunch seven days a week, um, and that's all you know, things that were raised on the farm, so everything that we sell um, in the cafe basically comes from, from farm to plate. Um, and actually last night was our first farm to table dinner, and uh, we did a group of 35 people, um, served a five course meal. Um, it started with hors d'oeuvres at the trout pond, a hay ride, and then hors d'oeuvres at the trout pond, and came back to the event barn uh, where we put on the rest of the dinner. Um, and that was a, you know, a big success, and I think it was, um, really nice for me to see food that you know we've grown and prepared and um, you know to see that end up on a plate and uh, being enjoyed by people who you know find that experience um, something that um, is of value to them and appreciate good food and to see it prepared and presented that well and eaten by people who enjoy it was uh, kind of the ultimate thing for somebody who's a grower. There's very few farms like Pond Hill but there are farms like that around and you know if we think about what farms looked like at one point they did have animals and they did have vegetables and they you know did hunt deer and they did grow grapes or other you know fruits if we you know whether they were grapes or apples or pears or cherries or that and so you know they're showing i think that one we can see you know one that that's still a viable farming operation to do those things and two that a farm if you're willing to work hard can do that with a you know a family and a few hirees. You know, they aren't hiring 40 people there, 30 people, or 20 people even, you know, but that they are um, hiring some people in, and so you can see that it doesn't take a lot of people if you know what you're doing and you're hardworking and you can, you know, prioritize things differently. Um, given the grant that we received, um, you know, and the data that we had to keep, um, you know, we had to basically track the numbers coming out of the, the uh, Hoop house is probably five percent, maybe, of gross sales, or but um, it's more valuable than that. Uh, the hoop house, I I think, is extremely important. Um, you know, it's just really been able to take our farming to another level as far as okay, now you have you're producing product 12 months a year. Um, you know, a quality product that you can count on. Um, you know, it gives you a leg up on the market as far as you know. You're always you know, ahead of where anybody growing in the field is going to be. Um, and so, you know, basically like coming out of winter, I start planting things outside, you know, and almost when the snow is melting. And uh, as soon as that stuff is almost ready to pick, we have, you know, our warm season transplants that will go right into the ground in that hoop house. And so, you know, you really shouldn't have downtime between you know, spinach and lettuce coming out of winter, waiting for the field production, you should be able to, as your field production comes on, tear out everything that's in that hoop house and have all of your, you know, your warm season crop ready to go, your tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. And, um, and if you don't do it as a, you know, all at once, the tear out, um, you can kind of stagger it so that, um, you know, you don't ever leave yourself without product. But, um, you know, every year is different. And, the weather this winter, um, you know, made it real easy. You know, it was warm and sunny a lot, and the winter before that, it was cold and dry. So, um, you know, you do the best you can. All you can do is try. You know, having our name on our pro on our products and other stores, um, you know, I'm a big advocate of, and I think, you know, it helps sell that product at the store. I mean, if you have a choice between, you know, several different spring mixes, and one is grown in Mexico, and one is grown in southern Michigan and one is grown in your you know your neighbor's backyard um, I think most people make that decision to support local um, as long as the price doesn't reflect some you know crazy astronomical difference um, I don't know for sure but I don't think that there's the money in Harbor Springs that there was at one time I and mean, when you drive up to the Spencers now there's a number of those houses on that the bluff there that are all for sale right in a row um, that are the big beautiful old fam probably multi-generational family houses um, from Chicago and from Metro Detroit. Um, but I do, I, I agree that someone could come there and, and the, what they're doing is generating income from multiple ways, right? So that's the idea of the grocery store, right? Is you go there and you get your milk and your bread and your cheese and your vegetables and your everything else there. And so they're doing the same thing of, you know, multiple ways, like multiple ways to generate revenue. And when people get to the farm, right, we know that the long, in retail, the longer you keep someone 
in whether you call it in your store or in this case on your farm, you know, the more money they spend. So by having all these multiple things, they're able, to, I think, to capture more money or more dollars from each individual person. Um, and that's pretty. I think that you know that's pretty unique to what they're doing. It's it's different than going to the farmers market. It's different than having a CSA. It's um, although they do those things as well. Um, you know, and then they add in the trout pond and the fishing as well. And then like you said, they're adding in the wine. Um, it's just it's a a unique really special place. Marcy, actually, we got into Facebook. Um, we were pretty heavily involved in moving the Harbor Springs Farmers Market downtown. It had a um, location that wasn't downtown, um, that in my humble opinion wasn't very well attended uh, by vendors or um, you know, mark people shopping at market and you know we saw that we went to other farmers markets and all in downtown areas. Um, we were going to Boyne City instead of you know driving by our hometown market every Wednesday and Saturday um, because when we did go to market it wasn't well, the monetary aspect of it didn't justify, you know, stopping at that market when we could go have, you know, triple the sales at the Boyne City market. But, you know, watching what a positive thing all the, you know, farmers markets are for downtown areas, you know, we thought, you know, this this market would be wonderful in our downtown Harbor Springs, and, um, you know, a lot of other people seem to feel that way, and so we ended up uh, you know, asking for it to be moved, and City Council shot it down without uh, ever, in my opinion again, but ever really reading um, all the background that we'd done on it. And they basically just said no, and they've said no before. And um, so we started a Facebook page, or a friend of mine actually posted it up, and we have 1,300 fans within like four days of moving the market downtown. And I think it really helped um, let city council know that people, you know, let people get their voice out and see and certainly you know this is something that um, you know they gave us a one-year trial period downtown to see how it would work and we appreciate you know getting that time and in my opinion it's um, it's our best market now um, you know as far as sales or one of our best markets um, you know our sales quadrupled from what they had been in the past up on the hill and um, you know it's a beautiful thing there's um, a friend of mine who lives up the road whose dad is 80, or maybe he's 90, late 80s, and uh, I've seen him at the farmer's market twice now. And I said, hey, you know, I saw your dad at the farmer's market. And he said, oh, he loves it. It gives him something to do. And, uh, you know, there you go. It's a social event. If not, you know, a place to go buy fresh local food, it gives people something to do. And, you know, the town is alive, and there's people walking around drinking coffee and buying things. And, um... You know, if you drive down an empty Main Street, you see a lot of for sale signs, it's not very inviting. But if you see a big gathering of local people having a good time uh, socializing with each other, I think that, you know, in my opinion, again, that's a value added to town. And